Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well. So today we have John Pops Arthur. John led an amazing life which could have come straight out of the pages of a movie script. It was that fascinating. Labelled the toughest man in America by Staten Bonner in an article in Men's Journal. He had illegal mafia around bare knuckle fights, including overseas fights to the death. He's been shot, he's been stabbed. He's arrested and killed some of America's most dangerous criminals. Uh, as an undercover FBI agent, this was. And not only that, but he is one of America's most respected boxing trainers. Five-weight world champion James Tony calls him Superman and told Staten Bonner, I was young and wild, but he stayed on top of me. He's different, Tony said. He shot and killed people. I've seen his gunshot wounds. You won't see that with no other manager. Billy Blanks, the 80s martial artist, I've seen him do stuff no one else knows how to do. He, I mean, he's fought to the death overseas. So how did John Arthur become this ferocious, feared, respected fighting machine? Born in Mississippi in 1950, he was one of 14 children. But to escape a lynching after his father had shot a bullying white shopkeeper over a fight and accusations of stealing, they fled overnight on a greyhound and they settled in the south side of Chicago. From there they moved to the Robert Taylor Homes housing projects, the largest in the world at that time. A uh, very dangerous place, violence, poverty and crime were commonplace. So John Arthur was the youngest of the 14 children. He was a favorite of his, of his church going parents. Very quiet and serious, but ruthless if backed into a corner. His brother William said, John's got a level head, but you can't push the wrong button. He don't take no mess. At the age of 13, Arthur's mum fixed him up with a job in an Italian restaurant with his, with his father. One night after being dropped off at the train station by the, a host from the restaurant named the Greek, Arthur and his father were heading to the platform to get the train when a man approached and held a knife to young Arthur's neck in a robbery attempt. Both Arthur and his father stood there terrified, panicking, rooted to the spot with fear. Out of the darkness came the Greek, who actually offered a wad of money to the robber. As the robber came forward to grab the money, Greek wrestled him to the floor and Arthur recalled he stabbed him in the neck numerous times. Arthur then said the blood came out bright red, then it came out dark. The Greek then told him, get on the train and forget what's happened. Arthur spoke to the Greek at work the following day, asking the Greek if he would train him to fight because he'd obviously seen that the Greek knew how to handle himself in that situation. He kept on pestering him to train him and eventually the Greek gave in and he began training Arthur in knife combat, kicks, punches, uh, repetition and drills, constantly sharpening the skills, even punching and kicking hanging pig carcasses that were waiting to be butchered. So John Arthur was working in the restaurant at nights. He was still doing his martial arts training and he was still working very hard at school and he became a very good footballer and a good wrestler as well. And um, during his time, the Greek, to toughen up John's fists, he would make him punch brick walls. John said his fists were as hard as lead pipes. So when John hit 16 years old, he, by that time he'd had three years of the fight training and the Greek took him over on a plane to Athens to a small village. And it was there that John saw the Greek fight in his first brutal match. Uh, the Greek ended up winning the fight with a, an arm bar where he snapped the forearm of his opponent. The Greek then said to John, what do you think of this fighting? And John remembers saying, that is what I want to do. So he, he'd already got that taste for that, for that type of no holds barred brutal fighting. So when they got back to Chicago, the Greek had an offer for John. And he said if John would fight for him in these matches, he would put him on the payroll and he would move John's family out of the projects and into a, a nice home of their own. Uh, he also explained to John that the Italian restaurant where John worked was actually ran by the Mafia. And then John subsequently found out that the Greek was actually a hitman. But he was there to help John out, so he's a friend of the family, regardless of what he did for the Mafia. So John was now at the end of his training and what he was about to be shown was the ferocious and savage way to finish these matches, these death matches off. He was pretty much shown how to kill somebody in one of these fights. 
in these brutal underground fights to the death, there were no rules. So you could headbutt, you could eye gouge, you could bite, you could stamp on the joints, you could stamp on the neck, you could stamp on the throat, you could choke. Um, there were no rules. So John even got his canine teeth filed into sharp points. So, and the Greek also taught him to fish hook, putting a finger in the mouth and a finger in the ear and pulling it so you could burst the eardrum and rip the mouth open and all the brutal tactics that you need in these fights. So when John was actually ready to fight in these death matches, he would be told by the Greek to meet him at O'Hare Airport in Chicago and then they would fly off all across the world. Uh, John would never know normally where he was going and uh, they would travel to a variety of countries to participate in, in the death matches. So what are the rules to these underground death matches? Well, if a fighter gets floored and he stays down, and then a fishing net is thrown on top of him and he stays on the floor and that signals that that's the end of the fight. But if he decides to get up and carry on fighting, then it would become a fight to the death. John Arthur said, if you went down, you'd better stay down and wait till someone lifted you up because the chances are if you tried to get up and fight on, you'd get stamped on the neck or stomped on the neck and possibly paralyzed. So the time came for John's first fight and it was against a very big, blonde, muscular man in a boxing gym over in Europe. Uh, John said he felt very, very nervous, as, as you would do in that situation. John said, though, that he had, a, he had a feeling that the rest of the men in the room were more scared of him because he was the only man of colour in the room. And he said he could feel a bit of tension, may, maybe because of that. Uh, but anyway, the fight started and both men traded off at the beginning. John managed to floor his big opponent jumped on top of him and managed to choke him out with a net being thrown over both of them. So uh, John was victorious in his first fight. So how did John feel after this first fight? Well, initially he felt a little bit guilty and he felt a little bit nervous about the whole thing. But the Greek said to him, look, you're both grown men, you both agreed to fight, so don't feel, don't feel bad about it, bad about what you've done. And from that moment on, John really, really loved the fighting and he really looked forward to it and it was a challenge to him. And he fought all over the world. Africa, Italy, Japan, Thailand. So the fighting was bringing his family out of that poverty. He was making a fearsome reputation for himself in the underworld fighting arenas. He would actually come to the ring wearing uh, red karate pants, black leather gloves and a Lone Ranger mask. He said he did this to be different and also to scare the opponents. And it was like a gimmick. John was mixing school with the restaurant work and the fighting. He graduated from Clark Atlanta University with a football scholarship. And he was encouraged by the Greek to keep up his education, education so he traveled down south to Georgia. Georgia, at that time in history, was a hotbed for KKK activity. There were 600 lynchings in the, in the mid 20th century. And the KKK were in all levels of society there, going up even to public office. And a lot of them were heavily armed. They had machine guns and everything. So it was a very dangerous place. And uh, a chance meeting with some police officers one night actually led to them offering John a job in the police force, which he actually accepted. And he became uh, one of only five African-American officers in the, in the whole community there. I think there was about 22,000 people living there. But John instantly made powerful enemies because uh, one day he pulled over the police commissioner's brother and uh, for drink driving this was, and the man in the car pulled on a KKK hood and John slapped it off his head and still arrested him anyway. And uh, the rules of the police force were you can't arrest a white man if you're black back then. And they put him on the graveyard shift as punishment. So he would work from 11 o'clock at night till seven o'clock in the morning. And, it, and he started to build up a lot of anger and a lot of resentment. And he was, he, by that time he'd married his girlfriend and he had two daughters, uh, but he missed them because he couldn't see a lot of them. So with this built up anger, he started kickboxing, those kickboxing fights. And then he, ev he eventually started to do the, the death matches again. Sometimes the Greek got him $5,000 for these death matches, which he was still doing all over the world. John Arthur has said that the bare knuckle fighting and the, and the death matches never bothered him, but he said 
the first time he shot a man still to this day haunts him and anyone that knows John says he's a very very kind and compassionate man very good principles and honor uh, believes in right and wrong and a man, a man of, of good good caliber John moved to Atlanta in 1973 and he actually became a special agent for the Georgia Bureau of Investigation and it was actually here that he would end up going undercover and actually rob some of the drug gangs and hand it back in to the police station uh, but during this time he had contracts put out on his life because the people he was dealing with were obviously very dangerous so it was a dangerous time for him John's life in Chicago and his superior fight skills made him a very very dangerous man when he was doing these robberies uh, with these drug dealers were killers themselves and very dangerous people but John was tougher and John was very streetwise as well and when going undercover John would carry a 357 Magnum and a snub nose 38 in his ankle uh, he himself was shot in the back he was shot in the chest with a shotgun he was stabbed he was even shot in the head in a robbery attempt where he killed the perpetrator but suffered a bullet wound to the head he actually wore a bullet around his neck which the doctor had dug out of his body so he wore that as a reminder sadly john's wife jerry passed away which sent him into a deep depression and he would go and rob the drug houses with a death wish almost saying to himself today's a good day to die realizing he needed to be there for his daughters he left the undercover world and started working as security and bodyguarding for none other than the 80s hit show the a-team because he actually knew mr t from as a childhood friend in chicago and minding work bodyguarding work for burt reynolds burt reynolds was fascinated by john so in 1997 john decided he'd had enough of hollywood and sort of bodyguarding the stars so he started doing boxing classes training boxers and on one particular day James Tony walked into the gym and out of shape James Tony. So John then started training James Tony, got him in shape, he would spar with him. Uh, many people would come and watch the sparring sessions. And um, I was lucky enough myself to meet John when I was honored to fight James Tony back in 2013 in London. So I'll put a clip up of myself, James Tony and John in the boxing ring together. Should be gone. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the action quarterfinal number two. Introducing to you firstly, fighting out of the red corner, wearing the black trunks and weighing in at 15 stones, 7 pounds, 10 ounces, 88 fight record, 75 wins, 45 inside the scheduled distance, just 8 defeats and three draws ladies and gentlemen three time three weight champion of the world lights out james tony and representing team uk and fighting out of the blue corner wearing the black trunks trim with silver weighing in at 16 stone six pounds 13 ounces seven fight records six wins two inside the scheduled distance and just one defeat from milton kings england ladies and gentlemen matt Lynn. it's three three minute rounds quarterfinal number two okay guys you know the rules be careful with the heads obey my commands at all time defend yourselves at all time god bless touch gloves there you go so that was a night that I'll never ever forget to share the ring with James Tony, and uh, John sadly passed away in January 2022. But he was known and respected by all the fighters. He was respected by the toughest of the tough in the fight world. Uh, his memory and his legend will live on. He was a truly fascinating character and such a strong man. I've got to say a big thank you to State and Bonner and men's journal because a lot of the information in this video was from the men's journal i'll put a link to that to that article so you can read more about john's life because i've only really scratched the surface of his life here and thank you to everyone for watching please like share comment and subscribe all the best